All right, so this can be a quick little guide on review sheet 10, hoping that you're gonna get a perfect. Remember, this is the first grade of the second quarter, second nine weeks, so you wanna get off to a good start. Uh, here, as you can see, they're getting a little bit more complex, right? There's a little bit more going on in it, all of these. Like here, you have, this is these are absolute value bars. So when you write PEMDAS, which you have to do, as you guys are aware, remember, these are technically just like parentheses, so your first step should look like this, and then you should rewrite everything. Remember, we only do one step at a time. Okay, so that's what your first step should look like. Whoops, it's just supposed to be minus. And then you'd go inside these parentheses next. We kind of do parentheses left to right also. So then, and then remember this little thing? I called this, you didn't have to write this, but I called this like you have a little mini PEMDAS in there. You still have to follow the, pe the PEMDAS when you go inside parentheses, same here. So, you remember, you can only do one step at a time, though. So that's going to be several steps. If you're trying to do this problem in this box, you need to go ahead and stop right now. Go find a, find a spot. on Like right here is a spot you can do it. Um, I think even on the next page there's room. There's room down there. So you've got all kinds of space there. So don't, don't try to jam it in. Here, this is an algebraic expression. So your first step, after you've written PEMDAS, you're going to need to write it again, obviously. Okay, is to turn that algebraic into a numeric. Okay, now we're given what x equals, so you just got to plug it in. So that's two thirds times three plus ten squared, so on, and then um, minus, and then notice that's a little exponent x, so that would be five to the third minus twenty-five. Okay, because we're just plugging in three for x, and then from there follow PEMDAS just like usual. Um, here. If you have any issues here, just refer back to uh, chapter two notes. Um, you got to know what the word vertical means, and then um, putting them on a number line. I think I think you guys can figure that out. Okay, here for this, um, this is something. This is the end of chat, the last learning target in chapter three. And as I look at this right here, remember that's my divisor. That's the same as this. Right? All division problems are fraction, all fractions are division problems. Remember, your divisor cannot, whoops, it cannot be a decimal. So what you have to do is you have to come up with a, a way to make that a whole number. Well, the easiest way is to make it 12, which means you just took the decimal and moved it once. Remember, when you move the decimal to the right one time, you're actually just multiplying by 10. Well, if you're multiplying the divisor by 10, what do you have to do to the denominator? So that's going to become... 20.4. I just moved the decimal one place. So the problem you're actually doing here is 20.4 divided by 12. Okay? And then from there, you know how to you know the algorithm for long division. Okay, for long division. Okay. Um, number four here, divide. Now those are mixed numbers. Both of them are mixed. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say it right now. I hope everybody's hearing me. I hope you're watching this because I need to see two steps. The first step would be just putting them in fraction form. So in this case, going around the barn. So that would be 7 fourths. This would be 11 fourths. Step two then would be doing the algorithm for division of fractions. Okay, so, and then from there you can cross simplify and do all that. But that's really the two rows you have to show. the Putting them in fraction form and then um, doing the algorithm for division and then doing everything you got to do there. Same with this one, two steps. Okay? Uh, next one. Okay, now look at this. Now we got some fractions being compared to decimals, fraction by fraction, decimal, decimal. Okay? Not all these are going to require work, but I'll put a little W next to the ones that absolutely require work. This one's going to require work. This one is going to re require work. No, it's not. Um, this one would absolutely require work. Okay, I guess this one kind of does. We'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, this one absolutely would require work, and this one would not require work, okay? So basically this one, you have to turn these, you need to either turn that to a decimal or turn that to a fraction, okay? Now you can turn that to a decimal by simply doing 2 divided by 6, okay? And then that'll turn to a decimal, or you can turn this to a fraction. So you just say the number with the place value, 34 hundredths, and then you have 2 sixths. 
you obviously need to find a common denominator there and then compare them that way. That's the work I would require here. Here, I don't know if I'd really call this work, but if you have one and one third, just go around the barn with it. That's going to make four thirds. So you can see that four thirds and four thirds, well, they would be equal to each other. Okay, so I just gave you an answer there. This one's kind of the same type of work. You can either turn that to an improper or turn that into a mixed. Does everybody understand that? And this one, you can never, you are never allowed to compare fractions if they don't have a common denominator. So you're going to have to find a common and no work on that one. Okay? Um, absolutely work required here. Um, this is a type of question that we learned about in chapter one. Okay? And as you can see, you can read through here. There's a keyword for you. Um, absolutely got to have work, the work that, I, that I've always required. All right, sorry about that. My phone rang. Um, regardless, I think I was talking about this one. Uh, find the greatest number of bouquets. So all this information is, is in Chapter 1, though, if you, if you have any questions. Um, I just refer back to Chapter 1. I believe it's Learning Target. I want to say 6 and 7 or eight. It's either, I'll write that, chapter one, and it's either learning target number six, number seven, or number eight. So whatever, whatever you, uh, if you have any problems, just look back to those spots in your notes. I believe that's the right spots. Okay, uh, next one. Okay, now this one here. Okay, I'm going to kind of give you a little help on setting this one up. Okay, now we're going to use proportions to set this up. Okay, now if, if you think back, we've done these on review sheets. Now this is actually chapter four and five. Chapter four and five, okay. I'm kinda gonna run out of space, but you guys can make it work. Um, we wanna use unit rate. Now if you'll remember what unit rate is, if you, if you can think back, if not, that's okay. But a unit rate is basically when you figure out per one of something, okay. In this case, I want to figure out the cost of one apple. That's a unit rate. Okay? So that means my, this is going to be money to apples and money to apples. Okay? Is everybody seeing how I'm doing that? And basically, I know that I can look up here and see that it's $3.39 for 12 apples. And don't, you, don't, you don't have to do this, but I just want you to, this is the way I'm going to teach it, so I want you to see it. But the basic idea here is we need to figure out how much one apple costs. That's what we need to figure out. How much does one apple cost? So I basically have a ratio that's comparing money to the number of apples. And then this ratio is going to figure out the cost for one apple. Okay, now these are equivalent, just like equivalent fractions. What did I do to my number of apples? Well, I divided by 12, right? 12 divided by 12 is 1. So what do you think I need to do to my amount of money? I need to divide it by 12, okay? And that's going to give you the cost of one apple. Well, if you know how much one apple costs, can't you just multiply it by 15 to give you how, many, how much 15 apples cost? Okay, so hopefully that helps. And if not, come see me. But I think that should make it pretty easy here. You're, just, you're taking your amount of money, dividing it by 12 to figure out how much it costs per apple, and then you can multiply it by 15 to get the rest of that information, okay? Here, um, just a quick reminder, what would, I, what would I have you make that number? Hopefully you're all thinking 27. Remember, I always said just take the decimal out. So do 345 times 27, and then go ahead and multiply it. And then once you multiply it all, then you gotta, you know, you gotta put the decimal back in, okay? which you should know how to do. That shouldn't be a problem at all. Okay, here, if you look in your chapter one notes, that's actually right in there. So you shouldn't get, nobody should miss that one because it's right in your chapter one notes. Okay, here, I would absolutely need to see work. Whenever you're asked to find the prime factorization, you better have a factor tree. And if you don't, it will be wrong. I don't really care what you think the answer is here. I don't care if you go through and try to just multiply them and figure out which one equals 60, it will be wrong. I need to see the work, okay? Let's go to the next page. All right, um, this one here. Um, I think you guys can figure that one out. I don't think I need to do much with that. No work required there on that one, no work. Okay, here, okay. Here's a square and here's a rectangle, okay. My advice here, what you're gonna do, you have to describe the areas and the perimeters of the two. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna figure out the area of this and the perimeter of this. 
you're going to figure out the area of this and the perimeter of this. Okay, Area is base times height, so in this case it would be 8 times 8. Perimeter is when you add up all the sides of the shape, so we'd add that plus that plus that plus that. That'd be your perimeter. Here, you'd have to figure out area and perimeter, and then just compare them. Do they have the same area, same perimeter, same area, different perimeter, and so on. Okay, So no work required there except for, uh, you, like I said, you should be uh, doing that. You should be figuring out those. Okay. Um, here, here's point P. If it is reflected over the y-axis, uh, what will be the coordinates of its new location? Uh, we just had these on, on re review number 9. Um, if you're still struggling, look back to your chapter 2 notes. I believe it's the last learning target in your chapter 2 notes. Okay, you can look back to that. Same with this one here. Um, it's going to be the same way on that one. Okay. Uh, the, this is like, these are going to, these four are going to go here. Uh, pretty pretty self-explanatory, guys. I think um, the one thing you need to focus on here that will throw you off is it's giving you a scale. That's what's different about this. Okay, so what that means is, Every little square isn't one, it's two miles. Okay? So you gotta count by twos if that if that helps. So you're gonna have to go through and say, okay, like if I was doing from the park to the art center, I'd have to go two, four, six, eight. Okay? So just keep that in mind right there. That's kind of the little that that's this is easy, but that right there is kind of kind of hard, can make it kind of challenging. Alright, the final page. Uh oh. Um here we go again. We have an algebraic expression, or an equation actually getting created, okay? Now, an algebraic expression and an equation are very similar, okay? Now, if I wrote this, this, this has nothing to do with it, but this question anyway, but just watch. If I wrote this question, 2b plus 3, you guys would all call that an algebraic expression, correct? Because it has numbers, operations, and a variable, okay? If I want to make it an algebraic equation, I'm going to add an equal sign in there. Okay, so that's that's the difference here between an expression and an equation. And then the idea with equations is we want to be able to figure out what that what that b actually is if we know what this is. Okay, so you're gonna have to go through and pick the correct algebraic expression or algebraic equation, and then you'll have to figure out what n would be. So I think that'll be kind of challenging this time because that's a that's not till later after. I mean that's something in the future that we're gonna learn. But I think this one's relatively easy, I think, and I think you guys can figure it out. You just have to read through it, and, and it'll make sense, okay? Um, this question looks familiar, doesn't it? Same question as last week, I believe, um, so nobody should miss that one, but no work required. And finally, create a dot plot, okay? Again, something that we're, we're trying to throw in here. This is not going to be till the end of the year when we learn this, but I'll kind of show you what a dot plot is. Okay, basically we have we have 21, so we're going to put a dot there. Get rid of 21. Okay, is there any more 21s? No. Okay, 25, I'm going to put a dot there. Okay, and then I'm going to see that I have another 25 there. Put another dot, and then another 25, another dot. So you're just going to have stacks of dots. There's another 25 right there. There's another dot, and I think that's all my 25. So you're just going to go through and it's going to make that. That's all you got to do there. And then you got to answer these questions. They're kind of scrunched down here, so make sure you don't miss them. Um, what is the mode? Remember, mode is most occurring number. And then your range, remember, is just the maximum minus the minimum. So um, your biggest minus smallest. So none of those should be missed. If you need to search Google search mode or Google range, you can do that. Um, but that's that. Okay? All right, guys. I hope this helped.